Good morning. Thank you all for coming by. Um, my name is Felix. I'm a senior staff engineer at Slack. And one thing I really like doing, um, because we just celebrated our fourth birthday, we're still a pretty young company. How many of you know Slack? Yes, that feels great. How many of you use Slack? Any chance? Also great. Perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm responsible for building Slack's desktop applications, the thing that you use not on your phone, but actually on a big machine. And uh, I'm a co-maintainer of a thing called Electron, which is largely what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so this talk is really about how we think about building desktop applications and how we think about intermixing web technologies and native technologies. And before we get started, I want to motivate this a little bit and sort of explain where I'm coming from with this whole thing. Um, in, my, in my world, JavaScript on the desktop is a little bit like CGI. Usually when people notice it, they dislike it. Nobody really wants anything to be slow. And whenever something is slow on the desktop, they're like, ah, JavaScript must be bad. Um, but the flip side of that coin is that I don't think people realize how much JavaScript is actually running on their machines. And I just have four examples for you. Um, Spotify is a popular and easy one that you may have known about. That's easy. It's a typical JavaScript application. Spotify was one of the first companies to build desktop apps entirely in JavaScript. But maybe a little less known is that the user interface in Battlefield 1 is completely written in React. So the little ammunition counter, the little map, that's all JavaScript. Um, it's written in React and MobX. And this is one of my favorite examples, because one typical, I want to say, trope that you read online is, oh, they did it in JavaScript because they don't know C++. That's usually not the case. It's not the case in Slack's case, too. The people who built Battlefield 1 really know how to build native stuff. That's not the issue. It's that React and MobX and HTML and JavaScript are really, really well suited to presenting information, like your ammunition counter, how many bullets you have left. That is made in React. Um, Another example is the uh, NVIDIA GeForce experience. If you have a Windows computer with NVIDIA on it, you're running Node.js and HTML. Um, and interestingly enough, I think the user interface is HTML. I'm not actually sure. More interesting to me is the fact that the GeForce drivers are running Node.js on your machine. If you have a GeForce driver, you're running Node.js every single time you start Windows. And GeForce is using that to orchestrate a little bit about um, how individual drivers interact with applications and how applications interact with the actual GPU. Um, and then we have something that goes one step further. If you use anything coming out of the Adobe Creative Suite, Photoshop, Lightroom, uh, Director, all these like typical Adobe apps, they all use Node.js and the Chrome Embedded Framework, CEF, to enable plugins, both external as well as internal. So every single time you start Photoshop, every single time you start Lightroom, you're running a little version of Chrome and a little version of Node.js. And they do that so that developers can build cross-platform um, add-ons, cross-platform experiences that run the same way on macOS and Windows and Linux, um, at least for the applications that are available. Um, and again, the, the, the friends at Adobe really do know how to build native applications. They're pretty good with that. But they chose Node.js and they chose CEF because they are currently the best technology available for this problem at hand. And the problem at hand is building cross-platform user interfaces and cross-platform presentation frameworks. And uh, the last thing there is, of course, all the Electron applications, right? Um, my Electron application, Slack, is, is a fairly big one, but there's a few I'm very proud of. The installer for Visual Studio. How many of you use Visual Studio? Is that still a big thing? OK, cool. So if any of you use Visual Studio, obviously Visual Studio Code itself is an Electron application, but the installer for the actual big Visual Studio is also an Electron app, which makes me like weirdly proud. That's like my favorite Electron app. But we have so many more that are like teeny tiny Electron apps. Um, that, again, use Chrome and Node.js to deliver cross-platform experiences. And whenever I say cross-platform, I want to qualify that a little, what that actually means, because so many people talk about cross-platform today. Um, I used to work at Microsoft years back. And for me, back then, cross-platform meant that you could build something for Windows 10, Windows Phone, and Xbox. Um, Today, now that I work at Slack, I don't really care about the Xbox at all, but I do care about Windows 7. That's like a big operating system. Millions of people still have it. And for me, it's really important that cross-platform includes Windows 7. Um, and 
So with that in mind, when I say cross-platform, I really mean desktop operating systems. I mean Windows 10, Windows 7, the Windows Store, the Mac App Store. I mean the Snap Store and all the Linux distributions. That's the cross-platform world that I'm talking about. The one where people are sitting in front of a big screen, an actual computer, and they're doing things there. And I don't really care about anything else. And with that in mind, uh, that is also the desktop cross-platform world that we're talking about. And interestingly enough, there isn't much that really comes close to that range. Uh, whenever, whenever we think about moving away from Electron and doing something else, it's very hard to find anything. Um, most of the things Microsoft is working on today really only work on Windows 10 and Xbox. Um, Apple is doing a lot of cross-platform stuff, but for them it's always the latest version of macOS and the iPhone. And I don't really care about that in combination. None of them care about Linux at all. Um, so it's, it's quite hard to actually find something usable. And Node.js and Chrome are the two big platforms for me that actually work on all these platforms. So whenever I give this talk and whenever we talk about the idea of Electron, um, th there's two camps of people who are a little bit concerned. The first one is web developers who don't really fully understand what that means, right? Like, what does it mean if you take JavaScript out of the, out of the browser? What kind of powers do you get? And we'll talk about that in a bit. And then the other side is C++ developers who sort of think that, oh, if I do something in Electron, I give up my C++ powers. So what is Electron actually, right? Like, how, how do you set up Electron? Um, the, first part, the first part is the Chrome content module. Um, it's the part of Chrome that turns JavaScript into pixels. Right? If you think about Chrome like a game engine, it's the thing that turns your HTML into like a colorful pixel on screen. It's none of the other stuff. Um, Chrome is a very big thing. Uh, it you know, includes a lot of things, but in Electron, we only use sort of the engine, the thing that actually displays stuff. And then the second part is Node.js, which uh, hopefully many of you have used in the past. It's a very powerful framework. It's um, the most popular tool for open source development today. Uh, NPM is the biggest repository of open source code that ever existed. Um, works really well and also equally cross-platform, very powerful. But Maybe the most important part is the C++ part. So my developers, my team works almost exclusively in C++. That's what we write. Um, all the Electron developers tend to work in C++. But most importantly, Electron includes a thick layer of C++ that exposes a bunch of native operating system APIs. Right? Cross-platform still means that at some point you've got to write some Objective-C. Um, for Windows, you've got to write some Win API code. And on Linux, you've got to write whatever you need to do on Linux, also usually C++. And not only do we expose this thick layer of C++, but you can write your own C++ and run that in your application. So every single time, my, my product managers come to me with some kind of interesting request. Um, I can make that happen because I can just talk to the Windows kernel or the MacBook, right? Like a simple example would be something like the touch bar on Macs. Wasn't necessarily very successful, but I can just code against the touch bar. I can just write Objective-C, and that runs on my Electron application. Or another example would be um, if you use Slack, we actually wait for you to stop moving your mouse before we start sending you notifications on your phone. Because otherwise, you would be sitting on your computer, you would be chatting, right? And I would keep sending notifications to your phone. It would be super annoying. So we actually wait for you to stop using your computer before we send you notifications to your phone. Entirely impossible with PWAs. Will not be possible within the next five years. And to me, it's a very simple question. It's the mouse moving. Should be fairly easy to answer for any developer of a desktop application. There's no way to do that in a browser. You can maybe check if the mouse is moving when the browser is open and you're on that app. But I need to know if you're sitting in front of your computer, right? I need to know if you have Slack open and it's somewhere in the background. And if someone sends you a direct message, I want to know if you got that, if you like saw that on your machine. I don't necessarily need to know if you're running Slack. We're not Facebook. We don't care how much time you actually spend in the application. My job is to make sure that you get your messages in a, in a way that's convenient. And for me, checking when the mouse was last moved is very easy. It's a one-line call on all three operating systems. All three of them give you a timestamp when the mouse was last moved. So very easy to do. And I'm going to give you a demo today of writing an app in Electron that doesn't use C++, just because most people think C++ is scary. It is. It's a very scary language. I sort of hate it. Um, 
but it is also the one that allows me to do anything. There's absolutely nothing I can't do with C++. And Electron's true killer feature is that I can build 99% of my application in JavaScript, and then sort of the last mile, the last little bit that I'm missing, I'm going to write in C++. Right? So that's the, that's the really cool part, and that's sort of the, the whole message that I always give at all my talks. Electron isn't necessarily so much about the JavaScript part, it's about really that like C++ part that sets it apart from having an app in a browser. Well, with that said, I didn't bring too many slides. I thought it might be more fun if we actually built something. Um, so let's go and build something. Um, OK, I have something prepared here. So let's just go and do that. Here we go. So what I have here is a pretty, pretty standard node application, right? Um, by the way, maybe quick signal from you in the back. Can you see that all the way there in the back? No? No? How about now? Better? Yeah? Doable? OK, cool. So this is a node application. And what I mean by that is that it has a package.json and it has an index.js. And if I run npm start, we'll go ahead and run that code. right? And you can actually see what it's doing when I run npm start down there in the terminal. It's running node, period, means run the current folder, and will execute my console log. Um, now, to turn that into an Electron application, easy enough, what you do is you install Electron, which we also ship on NPM. And yeah, there we go. It's actually working. All right. Um, you install Electron. And the only thing we change is that instead of using node, we're going to say we use Electron. That's, that's pretty much it. Um, as far as Electron is concerned, the first time you run it, it doesn't open any windows. It's just an invisible process, the very same way Node runs on your machine. So if I run my app here again, the same thing happens. Maybe one difference is that the application doesn't close, because Node.js usually runs all its code. And if it's done, it just exits. In this case, we now have Electron running down here. Um, and the application is sort of waiting for us to do things. So uh, we're going to do things. Um, the thing we're going to do is, for starters, is to open up a window. That's like the very first thing you want to do if you build a native application. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to say, I'm going to require a few things from Electron. OK. One of the things I'm going to require is the app. I'm going to say, app, as soon as you're ready, I want to do things. Um, and the reason we have this handler is because on all three operating systems, whenever you start a native application, you have this brief moment of time where you can do things to yourself, uh, things like append command line strings and, and track how you're using memory and all kinds of things. At this point, we're actually done. And the thing I want to do is I want to open up a window. Um, we have a class for that called the browser window. So I'm going to say const my window equals new browser window. And I've run that. I get a window. It's currently empty not very exciting, and also can't do much. In theory, you can open up the developer tools, but they pretty much crash right away. Uh, Chrome is made to not have content in it, so that doesn't really work. Um, but I can now specify what I want this window to be able to do. And one of the things I want is that it should have Node.js in it, which is one of the first ways to get some real power in your application. right? So if we do this again, um, we're going to need some kind of file that we can load going to make an HTML file. There we go. This is a pretty, pretty simple, straightforward file from a different conference, but it's the same HTML file. can rename that to InfoShare. There we go. And then in here, I'm going to say uh, my window load file index HTML. OK, now let's run this. Um, Easy enough. Now we have a simple HTML file. Um, but one thing that is cool that I want to show you okay, is that in here, I now have all of Node.js. So if I say fs equals require fs, I can actually start doing things. I can start reading my whole directory. Like All of this works now. I can use everything that's on NPM including native code. Um, if you have something like a SQLite application that uses the C++ code of SQLite, I could just install and require that. And that is actually what we're going to do now. Um, this is actually where we're going with this. 
because uh, we want to basically take a little, little piece of web code and turn that into a real application. And this is something that sort of happened when I was still at Microsoft. Um, Microsoft developed this thing called, they called it in the beginning Visual Studio Online. The name is actually coming back. But it was part of Azure, and they developed a tool called the Monaco Code Editor. Um, sorry, my microphone just fell off. Here we go. The Monaco Code Editor. And... Uh, that was sort of the precursor to what, it's, what you know today as Visual Studio Code, but it was basically a little code editor that ran inside the browser. And back then, someone basically made the joke, if we put this into an app and would give it to people, it would be a pretty good editor. And, you know, then they did, mostly as a joke, but that's what we have as Visual Studio Code today. Um, that's pretty much how that worked. So we're just going to build a little teeny tiny version of Visual Studio Code. So... How do we do that? I'm going to close our application again, and I'm going to install the Monaco module because I'm just running Node. I can just get my dependencies from NPM. That works for me. So I'm going to install Monaco Loader. There we go. And while that is installing, I'm going to add some style here because we're going to need that, which I think I have prepared, so you don't need to see me type it. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm just making sure that everything fills the whole window, uh, just so that even you in the back can see what we're doing. So now we're filling the whole window, and we're not, no longer building a document, we're building an actual application. And now the next step is, um, because this is really just a Node.js application, I can just use require. I can just say require renderer.js. Uh, and that will work because as far as this code is concerned, as far as the JavaScript engine is concerned, we're running Node.js. So obviously we need that file, renderer.js. And just to get us started, I'm going to just console log a little high here, right? And if we run this again, just to make sure that everything is still working, what we see now is that um, as soon as we open up the application, we get our little console log statement here. So now... Let's actually get our stuff in there. I'm going to close this again. I'm going to say uh, loader equals the Monica loader. And loader is a promise and actually returns Monica in the end. OK. So uh, what we can do now is we can actually create our editor. That's, that's what we want to do. Um, what I want to do is I want to say, take my div, which I think I called container, right? This container div right here. I want to put the editor right here. This is a good place. So document query selector. Oh, and by the way, this is another thing, right? Um, this is something many of us would still be using jQuery for, because maybe you still have to use Internet Explorer. If you're building an Electron app, I don't really care about any of that. I know exactly which version of Chrome you're running. I know exactly which APIs I can use. I don't need to transpile async await. I can just use it because I know that's what your browser has. I know exactly what your browser has. And in the case of Slack, that's really useful, right? Um, many of our customers are in highly constrained environments. They might just be running Windows 7. Their actual browser might be IE. But I can give them the Slack desktop app, and I can use all the modern stuff in there. That works fine. And then we're going to create an editor. Um, in this case, the code itself isn't too exciting. Uh, what we're really doing is we're using Monica, and we're telling it to please create a new editor. Um, none of this code was written by me, obviously. right? I didn't really work on Monaco. Um, but that's sort of the magic of the JavaScript environment. There's so much good code out there that we can use. Um, maybe you don't like React, maybe you like Vue, maybe you don't like Vue, maybe you like Angular. There, there's so much stuff out there that is pretty good and battle tested code in the same way that is not necessarily true for C Sharp. I'm an old C Sharp developer, that's what I was years ago. And finding good C Sharp open source code is pretty difficult. There isn't much out there. And uh, what is out there, you don't really know how good it is. So. Let's run our little application again. And if it didn't make any mistakes, we should now be seeing an editor. So there we go. Cool. Nice. So um, this is now already a basic code editor, right? One that I built myself. We can just copy in some code here. And uh, now we basically have a self-served editor. And if I say A equals string, 
um, this thing already knows. Actually, it should. I don't know why it doesn't. In theory, IntelliSense should already know what we can do. Uh, I guess it doesn't. It's kind of sad. Oh, no, it does. There we go. Cool. Um, so what you're looking at is pretty much the first version of Visual Studio Code, the very first version that ever existed. It was just someone go, all right, let's put this in an app, and now it's done, right? Um, obviously, there's a few reasons why this app couldn't be PWA. Uh, for starters, I don't, I'm not even talking about things like native debugging and like having a terminal inside the application. All of that is true. You couldn't really do that with PWA. But for us, it was as simple as being able to save files, right? Opening a folder, saving files, pretty basic operations for an editor. Um, but in here, that's pretty easy to do because you can just use the FS module. That's pretty much all you need to do. You just go ahead and run require FS, and then you go and load whatever file you need, right? It's fairly straightforward. Um, so that's the core demonstration, the one thing people always ask me is, okay, how do you get from here to having an actual application, right? Like, you're not going to send your customers a bunch of NPM code and say, run NPM start, and then you're running the application. Uh, that's not how you run Slack. That's not how you run Visual Studio Code. So how do you get from here to an actual packaged application? Um, there's a few ways to do that. The election community is fairly open. Um, there's one tool that we, the maintainers, run, and that's my tool. It's something called Electron Fiddle. I'm just going to show you this real quick. It's this tool. Um, it's part of the main Electron repo. And uh, Electron Fiddle is sort of meant to make what I just showed you a lot easier, this notion of quickly playing with a little bit of code and fiddling together a little bit of desktop code. So if we just close Visual Studio Code here for a second and open up Fiddle, um, this is pretty much the same application that we just built. There we go, same application. Um, but with one, one important addition, and that is that this application is capable of saving your app with Electron Forge included. Um, I don't want to go too deep, but Electron Forge is sort of a CLI for very common Electron operations, the most common one being turn this into an app. And we can actually do that um, up here in the tasks. And you might not be able to see that in the very back, but one of the tasks we have are package fiddle and make installers for fiddle. I'm just going to run the package fiddle command here. Um, and did we even implement Zoom? Yeah, we did. OK. So what's happening now is it's running npm install, um, which, depending on our internet connection here, might take a while. Um, but it's, it's essentially going ahead. OK, it added our modules. OK, install us, create it. There we go. Cool. So now what we have is we have a little application. This little thing right there is our InfoShare code editor. And if I just run this, we get our little editor. And I can now send this to people. And it's a working application. And they don't need anything installed. They don't need a browser installed. They don't need Node.js installed. This just works, right? There's absolutely nothing um, that stands in the way. Now, uh, one thing you will notice is that um, building desktop applications has all kinds of issues that PWAs and the browser has taken away for us. Installers and updating is a big one, right? Um, installing desktop software is actually surprisingly difficult if you do it at large, if you do it with millions of customers. Um, but thankfully, the election community is now fairly big. Um, our you know, biggest participants are obviously GitHub, Microsoft, Slack, uh, Discord, a bunch of companies. Um, Skype is a really big one, WhatsApp, Facebook, you know, all these giant heavy hitters. And interesting enough, none of us actually are in the business of building uh, desktop frameworks. Right? Nobody at Facebook woke up one morning and was like, Facebook is now also going to make money with Electron. And the same is true for GitHub. And the same is obviously true for Slack. Slack is never going to be a developer tools company. We're, right? I want to build Slack primarily. I need to maintain Electron to do that. But I only do that because I have to. So um, the upside is that with Electron, there isn't really anyone trying to make any money. We're just all trying to build good desktop apps as good as possible. And there's a lot of sharing going on. So. If we look at the actual code behind this, um, I'm just going to open up this like slightly changed framework. 
right here. It's the same application, but it has more stuff in the package.json, or at least it should. Sorry, let's just save that actually as a Forge project. Yes, 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 yes. Overwrite them all. OK, there we go. Um, so now we have Electron Forge in here, and all the typical installation tools that you need um, are really just one command away. And when I say typical installation tools, I mean something like an MSI for Windows that I can actually install right on Windows. You can't just send people the EXEs. They want an installer. You want a Debian package. You want an RPM package. Um, you maybe want an AppX for the Windows Store. You want a PKG for the Mac App Store. So going from this one thing that we built to having your app in all these stores is pretty much just one command away. right? And in this case, Instead of package, it would be make, which is confusing terminology, but the idea is that make makes installers and package makes the actual application binary. Um, now, that was pretty much as far as the demo, as far as the demo is concerned. Um, if you are interested in this, I have two recommendations for you. The first one is that we now have an actual Electron website, which we had for two years now, but you know, it's a real thing now. And the second one is, if you want to get started with Electron, I heavily recommend they use Fiddle. Um, it's obviously on the same website, slash Fiddle, just because it makes the whole entry a little easier and has demonstrations for all kinds of different interactions and all the tools that are built in. So let's say you want to you want to try something out. You want to play with some of the Electron APIs. Um, the Desktop Capture is a good one, maybe. Uh, desktop Capture allows you to record the whole screen. Um, you can fairly quickly go from nothing to having something working. Although the desktop capture currently is not working, clearly. That makes me unhappy. Give me one second. I'll just use a different Electron version. There we go. Try this again. There we go. And now we have a working desktop capture, right? Uh, with a fairly infinite tunnel. Um, and yeah, I mean those are those are things you can try out, right? We have a bunch of we have a bunch of different things in here. You can try them all out. You can play with the touch bar. You can play with um, our notification tools. Um, in this case, with Electron, again, you can send yourself notifications, even though they do not arrive right now. That is probably because the application isn't registered. Um, so yeah, give it a try. And lastly, if you have any questions, um, we're all pretty active on Twitter. Uh, we have about 20 Electron maintainers. Um, all we want is for you to be happy building desktop applications. So if you have any questions about this presentation or anything else on Electron, just find us on Twitter. And uh, yeah, that's about it. If you have any questions, now would be a good time.